Hello and welcome. This session we are looking at Affinity Publisher Beta, literally just released. If you don't know who I am, I'm Elaine Giles, longtime trainer, podcast host and inveterate geek. My YouTube channel is where you'll find tips, tricks and full training sessions for a huge range of apps. And one of those apps is this one, Affinity Publisher Beta. Now, I'm very excited about it and I would imagine most of the audience is very excited about it too. But why? What's, why are we so excited about it? Well, it's the third part of the Affinity Trilogy of apps. First of all, there was Affinity Designer. And then there was Affinity Photo. We've waited seemingly an age for Affinity Publisher. And this that is out now that I'm using right at the moment is the very first beta of it. Now, when they announced it, the actual release of this beta, they snuck in a little little nugget of information, which is Affinity Publisher is coming to the iPad. Oh, cannot wait for that. So uh, I don't think we're anywhere near seeing it yet, but it is on the way. Now, if you want more information about all of this, you can get that from affinity.serif.com. Um, they will give you all the information about all of the applications and you can download the beta from there. You do need an account, I think, to get the uh, beta downloaded, but no, no grief with the account. I had an account because I bought products from them. You may already have an account. If not, create an account and get it downloaded. So that's it. I'm now going to go straight into the demonstration. But be warned, it's a beta. There will be bugs. It will crash. We should have a drinking game. How many times it crashes every time? Have a drink. But having said that, let's go and have a look at it. This very first beta. Now, even before I open up Affinity Publisher, I'm going to open up this PDF file, which is the file that I'll be working on after I've gone through the very, very basics. But this is the file ultimately that at the end of this demonstration I will have created. So that's the front cover that I've got. And then I've got some spreads in here. So you can see on there, I've got graphics in it. I've got text. I've got flowing text between the frames. I've got title text. I've even got a table of contents. As we go through, I've got text wrapping around graphics. I've got page numbers in there. I've got multiple masters. I've got tables of information. I've got nicely formatted text. I've got all sorts of things in there. So I'll be showing you all these different kinds of things as we go through the demonstration. Uh, it doesn't look that pink in there, obviously, for real. Promise, promise. But there's a little, a little thing to tell you about that later. It shouldn't look like that. But this is the file that I'll be working on down the line. So just to give you an overview of this, first of all, and then go through the very basics and then get onto the advanced stuff like that. So I'll close that down and I will go into Affinity Publisher Beta. Let's have a think about it. There we go. Now, first of all, when you start it, you will get this welcome dialog. Uh, there is an option to show this panel on startup, which is the lower left hand corner. I've left it there so you can see it. The idea of it is gives you a little bit of information about the Affinity product line and also the samples that are available. And you can view tutorials from here as well. So the first thing I did was go into the samples and uh, download this sample and have a play with it. It's quite a large file, as you can see, 500 meg. So I'm not going to do that now, but that's what you can do from there. You can also create new documents from here and you can view those tutorials. But what I'm going to do at the moment is take the tick out of the box and close it because I'm going to be working on my own files. OK, so in here, I'm going to create a new file to start with. OK, literally just so I can show you the interface. So file new. I'm going to discuss this dialogue in a moment. So for the moment, I'm literally just going to click OK and that's it. Right. The basics of the interface will look instantly familiar if you've used either Affinity Designer or Affinity Photo. So to start off across the top, we have the toolbar, standard application toolbar across the top. Moving down, we then have a toolbar. On that toolbar, there are some buttons that I'll mention right now because they don't work. They're not supposed to work yet. But at the very top, you have what's the layout persona, which is publisher. Next to that, you have a vector persona. And next to that, you have a photo persona. 
and you should be able to flick between them. And when it's released, you will. At the moment, you get a message telling you that you need a compatible version of Affinity Designer, by which I, I think it must mean a beta, which I, I haven't got. So neither of those are functional at the moment. They're not meant to be. So just be aware of that. But that's where your personas are. If you don't know what a persona is, you change personas to enter a work environment, a workspace with just the tools for the type of work that you're trying to do. So at the moment, we're in that layout persona. So it's all to do with laying out information in a document. But in a vector persona, it would be all about working with vector graphics. And in a pixel persona, it would all be about working with pixel based graphics. So and there's also um, export personas, which is to do with exporting information. So a persona is think of it as a toolkit and the entire interface will change to give you the tools you need to do the job at that moment. Uh, we'll look at the buttons on this toolbar as we work through when it's relevant to do so. But just to point out that below that you have the context sensitive toolbar and the options available from there will change depending on the tool that you have active on the left hand side of your screen. So at the moment I have the select tool, the move tool. But if I choose the rectangle tool, draw out a rectangle, you can see the context sensitive toolbar has completely changed. All the tools that are in there now are relevant to working with the shape or the tool that I have selected, the shape I've created from the tool I have selected. Below that, you have the big area in the middle, which is your work area, your canvas area. At the moment, it just has the one page in it because I've only just created this file in a very simplistic way with just one page in it. At the very bottom of the screen, you have the status bar, which is this bit down here, which is always giving you lots of useful feedback. And I don't know about you, but I never read it. But for new applications, it's worth at least giving it a glance because it does give you a lot of information that can give you some handy shortcuts to make working much faster. So do keep an eye on that. Now, the rest of the interface is made up of panels and there's a lot of them. I need to caveat this demonstration with I've had to change my screen to 1600 by 900 to broadcast it because otherwise it would be so tiny you wouldn't see anything at all. A knock on effect of that has been that a lot of the panels that I have showing. So here's pages and then there's assets and symbols, tables of contents. And then one says tab, but actually it's the table one. So what's happening is it has to shrink it down to fit it into the space that you have available. There's another set of panels over here. So there's lots and lots of panels. I've actually got three collections of panels on the right. There's a colour swatches stroke text frame at the top. Then there's the layers and a load more in the middle. And at the bottom, I've got the transform navigator and history. So we will be working with a lot of these panels. I've got them docked in the best way to showcase them, I think, but there will be more that will appear as well. So uh, you can move those around in any way you choose. I've tended to leave them alone apart from docking the odd one to the side. So it, it when it appears, I know where it is for the demonstration. But as I say, you can customize it to the nth degree. Right. We've gone through everything in terms of the basics of what you're actually looking at there. So what I'm going to do now is just close that file without saving it. I'm going to go back and I'm going to start doing it properly. So file new. This gives you the new document dialogue. If you've used designer or photo, again, you're going to be instantly comfortable in here. There's a few differences because publish is a different beast, but there's enough familiarity that you won't feel lost. First thing you need to do is choose the type of document. So there's print, print press ready, there's photo web devices. Now I'm going to leave this for print. Ultimately, I'm creating a PDF, which is A4 and I want it in portrait. So the options at the top, print A4 millimeters. Then you've got facing pages. Now facing pages are like a magazine layout. So initially I'm going to want a cover page. But then I want the pages to alternate between a left hand page and a right hand page. So that's why I've got that set to facing pages arranged horizontally. And I'm starting on the right. Now, that's correct. The right hand side is the odd numbers. So the first page would obviously be page one and it would be on the right hand side. 
Don't get hung up about this if you're like, oh no, here we go. This is confusing because when you see it, you'll instantly know what I'm talking about. But in here, it's not very visual. You're just choosing it from drop downs. You've got your colour space, which I'm going to leave alone. Then you've got your dimensions. Now, because I've already selected A4, I don't really need to change the dimensions. But if you wanted something that was a unique um, set of dimensions, then that's where you would change it in here. So up there you can choose. But if one of those isn't right, then you've got your custom and you can choose it from in there and you can refine it um, in the dimensions option. Now, the one thing I will change here is these margins at the bottom. I do want a margin. I want a nice margin area to work in. But an inch is far too much for what I want. So I'm going to go in there and I'm going to put 10 for each one. So just go between using the tab key and set that to 10. And I'm now good to create my file. So click OK. And the only difference between that and what we had initially is that the margin area is much smaller. But other than that, it's exactly the same as I did the first time. So I didn't make too many changes there. Now, before I even do anything, before I add text, graphics, anything else either, what I'm going to do is I'll actually create the cover page of that magazine in this file. So I'm creating it completely from scratch. I'm just going to show you that over here in the swatches, we have a whole range of colour palettes. You've got Pantone colours. The ones with the Apple logo are your system colours. So, for instance, I have an application called Scrivener installed and it installs its own colour palette. And that's the Scrivener colour palette. I also have Affinity um, colour swatches up here as well. So the, it added greys for me and there's colours and there's gradients in there. Now, what I'm creating is a document all to do with Microsoft Office. And while I could probably find the Microsoft Office colours in there, it would be far easier if I just had them available. So what I'm going to do before I even start creating anything is go and import. So import a colour palette. There are three types of colour palette. If you have no interest in this, don't worry about it at all. But there are three types. There is a session that I've done on YouTube that explains it all. So uh, do a quick search for that if you want the detail. And when I say detail, I think it was an hour and a half. There was a lot of detail. But an application palette is system wide. A document palette just relates. No, an application palette, sorry, an application palette is affinity application wide. A document palette is only in this particular document and a system palette is system wide. So my Scrivener palette is system wide. My application palette would be the affinity ones. I only want this available to this particular document. So I'm going to import it as a document. Now I need to go and find it. And I've got them in iCloud in my Office Summit Assets folder. This is a good tip in terms of managing your, your projects. Make sure you've got everything where you know it is. So it makes it far easier to work with. So color palettes. And in here I have two color palettes. I have a document colour palette, which is just called document. It's got the Microsoft colours in it. And I've got this one called Microsoft. I'm actually going to import this one, which is an AF palette file. So it started life in Affinity. But this Microsoft one is an ASE file. And that's an Adobe Swatch Exchange file. And it can read those as well. So you could choose there which one you wanted. It's imported it. It's called document. So that reminds me it's a document palette. And these are my colours. So I have PowerPoint orange. I have Office orange. I've got OneNote, Excel, Outlook, etc. The colours are named for what they are. And because of that, it would be easier if I could actually see them. So what I'm going to do in the appearance is show it as a list. Makes my life a whole lot easier. I can now see which colours to use for what. So when I'm talking about Outlook, it'll be that shade of blue because I've got three different shades of blue. Right, so I'm nearly ready to go with this. All right, all I need to do now, I'm going to create a cover page here for my magazine. Now, if you remember what that looked like, there was a big graphic on it for a start. So uh, let's place the image. So I'm going up to File and I'm going down to the option to place an image. That opens up my file system and it defaults back to the last folder that I accessed, which was my color palettes. But I've got everything in my assets folder. In here, I have images and handily, I thought I had it as a cover. There we go, front matter. I did. It's there. 
And I do believe it's that one. And open. Now, it doesn't look like it's done anything. That's because it's loaded it into the cursor. So if we look there, that's not helpful. I was I was trying to zoom into that, but it's disappeared. So it's that bit in the middle there. Um, it, it changes it, it changes the arrow to a loaded arrow. And what that means is you can either click to add the image or you can draw the image out. Well, I want it on here, so I'm going to draw the image out. Now, I actually want that to cover the whole thing. So let me get it sort of in position and then keep keep drawing it until it covers up the bottom bit. I don't want it too much. Just to about there. Now, that will work if we look at the thumbnail on the left hand side. It's not extended the page and I can just about see the margin in the middle, but it's not great to be working with an image that's hanging off both sides where I can't see the edge of the page. Because of that, I'm going to use this crop tool here, the vector crop tool, and I'm going to crop that image back so it fits the page. There's the page there. And I'll do the same on the other side. So it's right at the top, the bottom, the left and the right which is great, but now the man's missing. So I'm going to double click. Are you going to double click? Oh, you're not. You're not going to let me do that. Oh, never mind. We'll do that with a different one. What I'll do in here is I'll just use the crop tool and drag it across. So I've got him there. So with that crop tool, not only can I crop it here, crop it to the right size, but I can actually move it inside as well. So I'll get that so it's just about right. Perfect and then go back to the move tool. Right, so I've got the background bit ready. I want to point out at this stage that as I'm adding elements, it's adding it to the layers on the right hand side in the layers panel. So this here is the image. And if I open it up, there's the crop attached to it. That's the crop that I've just applied to it. Next thing I need to do is apply a gradient across it. So I want to draw a shape right over the top of it. And it's just got a default fill of white. What I need to do is add a gradient to it. So I'm going to get the gradient tool, which is another tool available from the tools palette, which is the fill tool there. And I'm actually going to draw a cross, which will draw a gradient. Now, obviously not the best gradient I've ever seen. So I'm clicking on that first option there. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm holding down here my option key and I'm scrolling with my uh, mouse to make sure, because what's happening is you can see it's adding it and I actually want to select it. I want to make sure I've selected what's there, not that I'm adding a new one. With it selected, I can then go and choose a color. And I want this to be office orange. So that fills it with office orange. All right, let's come out of there and go across to this one. Oh, let's come out so I can see the whole thing. Right, there it is. I'm going to make that one office orange. And then I'm going to change the opacity of the office orange down to zero on one side and then go back and get the move tool. So that's looking great so far. Now, at this point, I need to point out, have I mentioned this is a beta? Right. I used the opacity slider to take to take that fill from 100 percent to zero percent, which is showing in the top right hand corner. But my slider is now stuck on the screen. That is one of the problems with this beta I'm working with, which is 0.57. So what I'm going to do at this point is use that as um, a prompt to save my file. So I'm going to save the file, call that demo and save it in there and then close the application down. That's the way to get rid of it if you uh, need to do that. So I'm going back into Publisher. I'll open up that same file again. She said, yep, yeah, you're going to let me do that. I don't fail on me now. There we go. And what you'll see is now that that opacity slider has disappeared. So I'm hopefully going to leave that alone now. Otherwise, I'll be in and out trying to do that. OK, next thing to do. It needed a frame around the margin. I had a white border. So I'm going in back to my shape tool and I'm just going to draw out a border. Now, that's not a border. What it's done is it's used the same fill that it had before. So if I move that, you can see it's, it remembers the last fill and it uses that. Obviously, for this one, I don't want that. 
What I do want is no fill at all. So I'll take the fill away, but I want a border. So I'm bringing the border swatch to the front and at the moment it's set to black. I want it set to white. And then in the stroke panel, I want to set that to a few more pixels so we can actually see it. So as I go right up to far too big, you actually start to see it. So I'll take that down to about four or five. No, four, 4.5, that'll do nicely. And let's go for square corners on it. So I'm now starting to layer the work. We have the image at the back. We have the gradient fill above that and we have the frame fill above that, which is reflected in your layers panel on the right. Now, this one you can see is the image. You can toggle these on and off just like in designer. This one is the gradient fill. It would be a good idea if you wanted to make your own life easier to put in there what these actually are. I never bother either, but it, it's good practice too, honestly. Right. Next thing. It had some text, I think. I can't remember what on earth it was, but it had some text. I think it said autumn. Online autumn 2018. Right. You have three different type of text tools. You have the artistic text tool. You have the frame text tool and you have the table text tool. Doesn't really matter which I use for this because it's just three words. So I'll go for the artistic uh, one up there and I'm going to put it in that corner. And let's draw it out about that big will do. And then I'll put it in. So it was online. And I think it was autumn 2018. That point, not great in black. So I'm going to select that and use the context sensitive toolbar to change the colour to white and any other changes that I need. So I don't really want it Arial either. Uh, the Microsoft font from their brand guidelines is that one. So I'll make it that. Now you can carry on doing to the nth degree in terms of formatting. You can apply styles to this, underlines to it. You can add character settings to it. I'll look at that in the other file. But for the moment, I've just put a heading on it and that will do for this file. The one other thing that this file had, this, this cover page, was it had a logo at the bottom. Now, you've seen me add a graphic, an image, this um, the, the image of the gentleman in the background. So I could just place an image, but the, the image that I actually need, I'm going to show it to you again, is one that I'll be using repeatedly. It's this Office Summit logo. So that's the back page. But as I whiz through it, it's also on the first page and there's another version of it on the second page. So it doesn't really make sense to be going around and importing the same graphic repeatedly. Because of that, I'm going to use a feature within Affinity Publisher Be Beta which takes away the need for that. And it's called the assets panel. And what you can do in here is you can add elements to your document and then add them back and store them as an asset. So these four elements that I've got in the assets panel means that I can just drag and drop out of there when I need it which saves me hunting the file system and everything else. Don't need to bother doing that at all. If I want them slightly different, so let's drag another one out, but yeah, I don't want it that size. You can scale it, not a problem. They are completely independent. But it's just a nice way of having access to things that you repeatedly use. So I've got that one there called Office Summit. So it says Assets Office Summit. If I click the drop down there, you can see there's lots of different collections of them. So there is the Affinity brochure. This was the brochure that I showed you right back at the beginning. These were all the assets for it. I click the drop down again. We've got MacBytes and I created this. So where there's the MacBytes logo, which I can add in. So I could put there sponsored by MacBytes. So these are all the elements that um, it just makes it a lot easier for me. I can just use those assets much, much, much easier. So that's what I've done there. Now, if I intended to use this online autumn thing multiple times, let me go back to my Office Summit one. It's as simple as going up here and I've got some things in this assets one as well. So let's open up that. And I can add from selection. It's that simple to add it. So anything that you can add on here, you can add into your assets. 
So a bit of an advanced feature, but if you know about it early on, you'll save yourself a lot of hard work later. So I've used some assets for that. So we've created a front cover. Now you need to be made aware that that's before we start going on any further, let's go back and look at the pages. If I were to add all the rest of the pages, it would be a long, hard slog to create what we need to create. But let's let's start off down that journey and try and make it easier. So within the pages panel over here, this is the pages panel at the top there. You have two distinct sections. There's master pages at the top, of which there are none yet. And there's actual pages. Now, a fuller word would have been content pages. So that's one way to fix that content pages. These are the pages that actually have the content on, whereas master pages are a starting point. In fact, they're more than that. They're a starting point to get you going. But any changes that you make to a master page will ripple through all of the pages based on that master page. That sounds complicated. It will become clearer if you're not familiar with this. It's actually quite an easy concept. We haven't got any yet, though. So we're going to work on that. But first of all, we need to create some extra pages. And you do that with the Add Pages button. You get the Add Pages dialog box and you can choose the number of pages. Now, I wanted quite a few, but uh, I'll say seven. Now, why an odd number? Well, that's because I already have page one and I'd like an even number of pages. So I'm adding an odd number here to the one I already have. Then I'm saying insert them after the page I have, because that's the cover page. So page one. And it's asking me what master page I want to use, but I don't have any. So none's the only option. So I'm going to click OK there and that will add in the seven pages that I've told it to. Now you can get the idea of the difference between pages like this one and spreads, which is that one, which is page two on the left and page three on the right. And I have four and five and six and seven and page eight at the back there. Now, I could start working on these pages and do them in the way that I've done the cover page and add everything by hand. But that is not the way. So a much better way is to even before you start adding any more content, create the master pages. So what do you want your master pages to look like? So I'm going up to the pages panel and adding a master page here. So add a master. It needs a name. So I'm going to call this office, this first one. And that's because all the elements I add to it, I'm going to be creating with the office swatch color. It needs to be. Um, the set the dimensions of the page, which is A4. But before that, is it a single page or a facing page? Now, I want this for a spread, so I want it to be a facing page. If I wanted it for the cover or the back page, I'd probably make it single. But I want this one to be facing. And all I need to do is to click OK. And that adds this new master page into the master pages section at the top. You switch between these pages by double clicking. So double clicking on the page one there or double clicking on the office spread up there. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to create for you the very page that I've used throughout the other document, the advanced document. This was my starting point. This was how I started with it. I had a solid block of color on the left hand side, which I did like that. Now, it doesn't look like that's a solid block of anything. And it's not. It's um, remembered the last format and the last format was a white frame. So I need to go in and say, no, I don't want a stroke on there. So take that away. And in the colors, I am going to get my document colors. And I want it to be the office color. So I've got my solid block there. The other thing that I had, and that's not quite positioned right at the bottom, that's better. Uh, was on the right hand side, I had another strip. So I'm holding the option key down and I'm pulling that over there, which makes a copy of it. Now, you can just about see that I've got green handles, uh, green lines and red lines telling me that this is aligned. Uh, red means it's horizontal, or horizontally aligned. Green means it's vertically aligned. So that's pretty great where it is. I just need it much smaller. I only need it at this end, five millimeters. So uh, it's snapping. I've got snapping turned on. It's snapping between four and eight. 
So I'm going to go down into my transform and actually put a five in it and uh, move it into position, which is just at the edge of the page. Now I have a master page. Now I'm going to carry on working on this master page, but I'm not going to see much much difference because we haven't applied the master page. If I go into page two and page three, not there. Really simple to apply. You've got a couple of options, but by far the easiest one, point to the middle, drag and drop on the middle, and it applies that master page onto pages two and three. Drag it down onto four and five, and it will do the same there. So we now have multiple pages with the masters applied. But I'm going to click on the cover and then double click on Office to make sure that I'm editing my master page. I need a couple of other elements on here. I had a flash at the top, which was like um, just a white thing. Uh, yep, 60, I think, was the size. That, that one's remembered that it needs to it needed to have the office colour, which I don't want now. I want it to have white. There we go. Then I need some text. So I'll put some text on it. And I think the text just said office. So put in there. We definitely don't want that. No, nope. no, no, no. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, a text frame there just in case it's going to get giddy on me. And I'll just put the word office in. Now, it's far too small and it's Arial. So I'll just format that to be about right. So 20 and that Microsoft font, which is that one. Don't want it to be black either. Not useful. So I'll make that the office colour as well. Now, a far more use on master pages are elements that you want to automatically update. So if I just go and show you that on pages two and three, the changes that we made, which was the white flash and the office, have rippled through straight away. So anything that we do on this master page is going to ripple through to the other pages that have this applied to them. Then down in this corner here, it would be very handy to have a page number. So another text frame and just draw that out and actually just type the words in page. Doesn't look like I've typed anything because it's in Office Orange and I need it to be white. Now, I don't want to type a number. Obviously, I could type one and it would work, but every page would be called page one. So just to show you that, I have actually typed it in. There's page one on that page and that's page one. Problem is that's page two and that's page four. So no prize there. Let's go back up here and take that number one away. And this time we want to insert a page number. So text insert page number. It looks identical doesn't look like there's any difference. But if we now go and have a look at page two, it's reporting page two and page four is reporting page four. Not the best place text I've ever used, incidentally, and uh, it's far too big. But never mind, I will fix that. So I think 11 or 12 would probably be better there. Now, over on the other side of this, I need another one of these. So I'm going to drag that across. And I'm going to use those snapping guides. We should be able to see them as I get it just in the right place. Right, that's a line, but obviously that's now the wrong color. So I'm just using the swatches that I had the foresight to load to add them in. Now page two is fine, but that needs right aligning. So I'm using that context sensitive toolbar, the right alignment option to align it to the right. And now I've got my page numbers on it. Now I'm thinking what else I need to do on this. What I did with it was I went in and I added in some, where's my guides? Where's my guides? My grid and access, axes manager. And what I did with this, which it's helpfully opened on another screen, was I didn't use an automatic one. Now, the reason I didn't use an automatic one was I've used um, the Microsoft brand guidelines to create the look and feel of this. And they used tiles, a tile metaphor to lay it out. And it worked brilliantly if my grid was set to one centimetre square. So that's what I've set it to in here. Take away the automatic, make it basic and set a spacing of 10 millimetres. And OK. And that gave me the grid that you can see there. 
The other thing I did was it's okay having the grid, but it would be better if I knew where the squares of the content could go. So what I then did was I used the rulers to add in extra elements at five centimeter spacing. So that one's at 60 millimeters because it has a margin of 10. So there's 50 there. And the next one is at 110 and the next one is 160. Then I did the same on the other page working backwards. So 360 there, 310 and that one there. Then I dragged them down from the top. And what I was doing was creating squares. This square that you can see there, that square is five centimetres by five centimetres or 50 millimetres by 50 millimetres. What I wanted to do was do that for the rest of the page. And that gave me my tile layout. It won't do if it's one out, will it? That gave me my tile layout for the entire document. Perfect. As I go through to my other pages now, at the moment, you should be able to see the grid and it's erratic. It's coming on and off at will. But you can see my guides are there. Sometimes the um, grid's there, like here. You can see it on the left hand side and sometimes it's not. I'm sure they'll work on that. It's a beta. But I can use my guides for layout purposes. Right. At that point, I'm looking at this master page and I've created quite a lot of stuff there with it. What I'm just going to do is instead of making that orange, I'm just going to change that text to grey. All will become clear why in a moment. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to add more pages to my document because I had a lot more pages than that. These are not master pages. These are just pages. And I'm going to add another odd number. So let's add those in. Uh, oh, no, that wasn't clever this time, was it? I'll just add one more in there. Just one. And that should finish it off with a back cover. There we go. Now I'm doing that for a reason. Not all of my document needs to be formatted as orange, but I've just made my beautiful master page and now I need one in green and one in purple. Well, it's much faster to just duplicate the master rather than create one from scratch. So I'm going to go into there and duplicate. I now have this one. It wants to call it office, but I want to tell it otherwise that this needs to be called Excel. Making sure this is the one I'm editing, I'm going to select that first element, select the second element and just make it Excel green. Go up to the text. Don't want that to say office. Want that to say Excel. And the last thing I need to do is to make that Excel green. How easy is that? I've not applied it. It's not nested masters. I've made a duplicate and then edited what I need and then add it to the other pages I need it adding to. And it's that simple to carry on doing that. So up to this one, duplicate that. And this time I want it to be one note, which is purple. So uh, I've got my one note purple over there. I'll go back, get my move tool, select these two elements here and make those one note purple. Obviously, at the moment, it's still called Excel, but I will rename that to OneNote and apply that. Now, the other way of applying this is to right click on a page and choose Apply Master. And that gives you this dialog box here. And it shows you the master's pages that you have available. So I'll choose OneNote in there and OK that. And it applies that to pages eight and nine. So it's that simple to get going with it. Now, I've done the cover page and I've done some pages. I've explained the differences between pages and spreads and we've done the master pages. We've looked at guides and shapes and text boxes. Uh, we've looked at ooh, I'm having a look what we have looked at page numbers. We've changed the properties of the text. We've added a custom grid and we've done some guides as well. Now, at this point, I don't really want to carry on with this file and start building up the file that you saw initially because we'd be here quite a while. What I'm going to do at this point is close this file down. But the file I'm about to open was made exactly the same way. It just has more content in it. Um, in fact, I'll leave that open and we can flip back if we need it. But I'll go into open recent and I'll go into the actual Office Summit file. 
and I'll show you what we've got here. It does look almost identical. All right, in the master pages, I've got the office one. I have another one that's a continuation. I have another one here, which is a plain continuation. The difference is it doesn't have anything on the uh, flash at the top. But then I've got OneNote and that's identical to what I've just created and Excel, but I've got more of them. I had one for Outlook, one for OneDrive and one for Word. Uh, I also had PowerPoint. I created a black one. And I had one for the cover in case I wanted repeating elements on the cover and one for the back cover. So I've got a lot more master pages, but the principle remains the same for them all. So those are the master pages that we've got. Within the pages inside the actual document, the cover page was virtually identical. But as I just take you through the file, the first one, the first page, had uh, the flash coming through from the template, but I've actually added in some other elements. So I've got graphic, I've got a table of contents, I've got some text, not formatted, and I've got a heading up here. Now, hopefully as we work through this file, you'll be able to see that I've used the grid for laying out the elements. And that way, although that one doesn't actually work, does it? Because it would need to be wider over there and that over the top would need to be wider. There we go. That's that fixed. I've used the grid that I created so it matches up. So they're not just randomly placed. OK, uh, you'll see that in this one better, probably, which is I've got elements here and here and here and one that's stretching all the way across. Now, I've switched to this file so I can recreate the content of the page without having to recreate all of the background. So this page is one that we'll be doing. And this is my starting point for that. The dots are what I have to show you what to do to finish off that page to make it look like that. So there'll be image placement. They'll be adding a heading. They'll be adding text and working with columns and they'll be making a table. Then we've got this Excel one and that's got some very nice formatted text very nicely formatted. I'll show you how to do that as well. So we'll be recreating that page. Uh, the other elements we've got here is this page, which um, we'll show you about wrapping text. It's coming around this graphic here. So I have one of those and I'll be moving that in. You see at the moment it's not wrapping, doesn't do a thing. Then there's this one, which is a really great tip. If you're watching live, have a look at that page. I'll zoom in, give you an idea, let you see the background of that so you can see it all, what's behind it. What could I possibly be showing you with that? If you're with me live, put that in the text chat. What about that is going to be tricky? Um, and to give you an idea, that's what I'm going to be starting from with that. So there's obviously something missing. There is my pink graphic. What, what could be the problem with that? I'll let you have a think about that. Uh, I've got more pages in here. And I've got this one, which I'll show you laying out the graphics. So I have a duplicate of that and I have some other pages which we'll be looking at. So let's go back and let's have a look at that OneDrive page. How did everything work in here? Well, first of all, there's four graphics on there. If we have a look at my starting point, there's two of them, but not the other two. So I'll explain to you, which is I'm going to get rid of these dots as I explain it. And that way I know I've not missed anything out. Right. The pink dots mean explain stuff. So I'm about to explain that these were placeholders that had a graphic inserted. Now, so far, when you've seen me insert a graphic, you saw me draw it out. But you can do it where you already have a placeholder. So in here I have two placeholders. There's this first one, the second one down here. So I'm going to select the first one. And I'm going to go up to file and down to place. And this is the OneDrive section. So in my assets, I'm looking for my images and I'm looking for OneDrive. And somewhere in here is the graphic that I need, which I think is that one. And I'm going to click open. And that places the graphic in that frame. It doesn't look great. It looks quite tiny, but we'll work on that. If I go to the second one here, go back and do the same. File, place. And this one was architecture. This was the server room and it's put that in there, too. Right. Problems with both of those. The placement on the first one is just a little bit too distant. We're going to double click 
and you now see that there is a different set of handles. So click away, select it once and you're selecting the outer frame. If I scale that, it will scale the entire outer frame and the contents within it. Let's undo that. Double clicking and I'm not scaling the frame, I'm scaling the contents. And that's exactly what I want. I want to scale the image inside the existing frame and put that there so it's much bigger. Now, this, this one down here is more of a problem because if I do that, double click, and I scale this, it's going worse. And if I scale it down because I want to see the servers, then I've got this grey bit and that's not working at all. So that's not going to work. I'll just undo that. So I'm not with this one going to double click. That would be double clicking. I'm not. I'm going to select it once. This time I'm going to scale the frame, not the file inside it, the actual frame. And doing that will expose more of that image and I can actually see it. So there's a big difference between what those two options do. So if you find yourself scaling something and thinking, I don't want to change the actual frame, I want, I want the contents inside it. Double click for the contents, single click for the frame on the outside. So that's got my graphics in there. Now, while we're talking about graphics, I'm just going to show you quickly in here. And unfortunately, I actually have those in there and I shouldn't have those in there. No, no, no. I'll get rid of those and show you that the other thing you can do when it comes to file place, and these are OneNote graphics this time, so let's go and find OneNote. I've got four graphics that I want to place. That's my alarm clock, my appointment, the icon and the year. You can actually select them all. You can select the first one and shift click the last one, or you can hold command down and select them in any order you like, and then click open. Now, at the moment, it's not actually placed them anywhere. That's because there's nowhere to place them. There's no frame holders, uh, placeholders. But what it's done is it's opened up a panel called place images. And these are the images. And it's going to allow me to load up in the one I want so I can choose which one I want to apply first. I think this one was the top one. And I can actually draw out my content. So I actually there don't really want that that size. But what I'm doing, I'm just going to place these in here. That was the second one. And I think that was up there. That time I clicked once. I didn't draw it out. And you can see it's far too big. And it's loaded this one in. So I'll draw that one out. And the last one it's loaded in and I'll put that down there. Now that is huge. That's absolutely huge. So um, yeah, let's get that back and we'll scale that. But I'll show you how to do that. I'm holding down the option key and I'm zooming all the way out. Oh, good grief, it's massive. But what I'll do is I'll scale it right down and pull it into place. So you can see I'm working actually off the page, but you can do that. So I'll get it down to a reasonable size, get this icon back on and then zoom right back in so I can see it and lay these out. Now, you see the mess that this has created. It wouldn't have done that, would it, if I'd have put placeholders in. So let that be a lesson. Put placeholders in. Placeholders are your friend. So I'll get this in position. I think it was around there somewhere. And I want it about that size. This one needed to be scaled to 50. And that was at the top somewhere. This one here, I will move that back. Oh, it's squashing it up, but never mind. And get those in place. So that was really just to show you that you can here. Let's move that. Oh, you're not playing ball at all, are you? Right, there we go. That'll do. That'll do. There they are. That was just to show you that you can place files by collecting them all together and then use that place panels, uh, the, the place panel to load them in. OK, so we'll get back to the page we were recreating from scratch which was this one. We'd got our images in. We now need this one at the top. So I'm going back to the page here. It was this element here. Hopefully now you can see the benefit of creating the framework. In terms of I will get a text frame and I can use that grid to create it exactly as I want it. Now, what it's done with this is it's put two lines down the middle. It's using columns. If I look up here, I'll show you that there, columns, two columns. It's remembered that from the last time, but I just want this as one column. So I can change the number of columns up there just by clicking that up and down. 
and in here it was what was it called it was called OneDrive your place of safety right OneDrive your place of safety doesn't look anything like right but we can work on that so I'm changing the font to the font I want it to be if you're wondering about styles I'll get round to that but at the moment I'm not particularly worried I just want to make sure that it's the right color which is OneDrive it's a reasonable size uh, 48 looks fine to me and I want it aligned over on the right hand side so I formatted that Next thing I need to add is some text and that text went in there. So I'm going to do that in exactly the same way. She's just draw myself out a text frame. This time I do want it in columns, though. If we flick back to what we're trying to recreate, it was in three columns. And now you know just how easy that is to fix, which is just select it and choose three from the columns up there. Now, I'd like some text in it so you can see text in it. Right. But I haven't got any text to put in it unless I start copying and pasting around on the rest of it. So if I go up to text, I can insert filler text so I can get a look and feel for how it looks. But it doesn't look great. But what I'm going to do with that is I will just make it smaller. So uh, I'm going to use my text styles body and it will just change it to a pre-configured look and feel for that text. So that shows you it is actually in three columns. Then I need to create a table because this information up here was a table. It's not a standard table, though, is it? Tables are boring. They don't have to be boring, though. Tables can be very useful for laying out your content. So that's the information that I need to see. That's the information that I need to add into this table. So memorize it because I'm going to go into a different view in here zoom in and let's recreate it. So get rid of my red dot telling me I've got work to do. We've looked at artistic text. We've looked at frame text. Now we're looking at the table text tool. So what I'm going to do is click and drag that out. Now, as I drag, I get more columns and more rows. And this beta, you have to delete them row by row. And I'm not sitting here forever doing that. I need two columns and four rows. So I'm going to pull it up until I get two columns and four rows. The rest of it, in terms of it's not the right size, I can deal with by stretching it out. That will do nicely. And I can move that into position where I want it, which is lined up at the bottom. Then I just need to put my content in it. So double click to activate that. And I'm in A1 here. Who's already forgotten what that table said? Luckily, I can remember it said plan and it said price. And the price was dollars per month. Not looking great so far, but at least the information's there. The first one was the five gig plan, which was free. So let's just get that right. That was free. The next one was 50 gig. And that was one ninety nine a month. And the next one was six terabytes. Brand new changes from Microsoft. You get six terabytes for seven ninety nine. And I'm putting a note on there, putting two notes on there, actually. First note here is includes. Office 365. And this one needs a note, which was one terabyte per user. I know the table's not looking grand, but it will be. So that's the information in the table. And as you look at it, it's probably one of the ugliest tables I've ever seen, but never mind, we'll fix it. All right. Uh, first thing with it selected. Uh, was it all the same size? I do believe it was. So uh, let's let's get that to a reasonable size. 14, 15 looks hopeful. So let's scale it down so it's uh, the right size before we go much further. Right. Next thing to think about is formatting it. Well, you can format some of this from here. In terms of not going into the table mode, I'm just in text mode at the moment. The tools I have up here, the context sensitive tools are text tools and I can use the center vertically. So that sorted that problem out. The next thing I want to do, though, is to go in here and select those two cells. And I'm going to go up to here, which is my table panel. Now, I said you can these these may appear anywhere. Uh, they might even appear on a different monitor. I've docked this so I know where it is for the demo and I put it up there. So in here, 
I need the fill to change. I need the fill to be the OneDrive colour, but not all the table. So not from there. This top bit is everything. And then you've got your stroke and fill and then you've got cells, etc. So in here, need to make sure that that in there. Uh, tell me this is right. Go on, tell me this is right. Uh, that's the border. That's not right, girl. <laughs> it's not the border, is it? It's the fill. It's that one up there. Let me do that. That's better. That's what I want. Not the border. And while I've got that selected, I also don't want black text. I want white text. So I've made that text white as well. This text here, I want to be grey. So back over here at the moment, and we've got grey. So I'm choosing from the swatches there, that grey there. Looking decent. Other things I need to change are that needs to be smaller. So I'd probably take that down to 11 or 10 or 11. Uh, same with this here. But I didn't put in a closing bracket, or did I? No, it doesn't look like I did. Right, let's get that. Do the same with that. So 10 or 11. And that bit there. 10 or 11. OK. Next thing to think about. I need to take away all of the borders that are on there. So at the moment, we have an outer border by the look of it, which I don't want. So uh, let's make sure in here that everything, all of these, we have nothing. So I'm going to take that away. Hopefully now when I click away, there's nothing there. But I need to add borders back in, but only to these six cells here. And what I want those to look like is all the horizontal ones, not in that colour. I want it to be the grey colour and a half will do fine. So we'll go for a half there. So let's click away there and I've got those in. And the next bit I need to do is to choose those three cells, this time adding a left border of, was it a half? I think it was half. And I don't want black, I want the grey. And now we've got a very smart looking table. If you are looking at it and thinking, hmm, I can't quite see because we've got blue dotted lines and all kinds of things going on. Let me show you a very, very useful tip, which is Control and W. Control and W hides all the elements that you used to lay out. So all of your borders, your margins, your guides, everything hides the whole lot. Let me go to the full screen there and show you that command, uh, control and W. And yes, that's control and W on Mac. So all of that disappears. That's very useful. Uh, in conjunction with that, if you press the tab key, the whole of the interface disappears, which means you can use your command and zero to get a very nice view of what that will actually look like. So if we compare that now, which I've created during the demonstration with what we had before, it's not a million miles away from it, is it? It's not too far away at all. There we go. Tab to bring that back and Control and W to bring back all of the guides and stuff. Now, that was a table that actually had information in it. So it was, I've used that in a presentation before, it had information in it, but you can use tables. They don't need to be boring. Tables don't need to be boring. Let's have a look at something else that's a table. That is a table. Prove the point. Double click it. Uh, you let me click. Come on. I want to see that grid. <laughs> I want you to see that grid. Come on. Well, isn't that typical? Don't you just love it? Come on. There we go. You can see the grid around the edge, the A1, B2, etc. So that is just an affinity publisher table. Yes, it took a while. Also in here, and these again are affinity publisher tables. And I'll do that. There we go. They're just tables. They are very precise in terms of size and layout, but they're just tables. We also have solutions for those as well, done in a completely different way, but we'll come back to that. OK, so what we looked at on that page, what we took uh, from that and, and rebuilt was putting the title on it up here in a text frame. We've got text frame options down here. We put the graphics on, we scaled the graphics and we put the table on. 
I am now going to move on to the Excel page, but on the Excel page, I'm going to show you, we're just going to concentrate on text, which is if we look at what we've got here, we've got this formatted in the right colour. We've got inline headings over here. We've got little characters hanging off the sides in different sizes. Uh, we've got bullet points. Now, that's what the text looks like now I've finished formatting it. But if we go to what it started life as, it started life like that. So let's fix this properly. All right, first thing, I can click on the text frame and you can do things at the text frame level. So there is a text frame panel within here. You could give it a fill. So wouldn't be great to have it Excel, but I could if I wanted or Office. But I'm going to set that to none. Can also in there choose a stroke for the frame. So I could put an Excel border on the outside if I wanted to. So I've got a very, very fine thing there. But if I make it bigger, you can see that that's putting a text frame on the outside. Obviously, at that point, I've got text overlining it as well, overlaying it. So that doesn't look great. That's why we have insets on the text frame level. At the moment, if I change any one of these, there is an icon there, which is a lock, which is going to change them all. So I'll zoom out so you can see the entire thing and just do that. As I do that, it indents the text, insets it within the frame to give the text breathing space around the outside. You can also disable the lock and maybe take that up at the top. So more space at the top and you're only changing one. If you turn the lock back on and you make a change, they all go to the same. So it doesn't keep it in proportion. It sets them all to be the same. So I actually had that initially set to nothing, but we'll 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 leave it set to uh, we'll leave it set to one. But I really don't need a stroke on it. So I'm going to take the stroke away. OK, so that's the text frame properties, but it's the actual text inside it that we're looking to format. So I'll double click on it there and select all of that text. What I want to do with that is change um, the colour. So first of all, I'd like it to be Excel green. So now my text is Excel green things to point out at this stage. And I'm just zooming so I've got somewhere to stick it. At the moment, it looks like the text is just right. It's like the three bears. It's just right, but it's not. There's an overflow on that. The reason that it looks right, and I am going to zoom in here, that eyeball there is the text overflow. And as I click that, it shows me the text hanging outside the frame um, just at the bottom. Depends on the alignment where you see it, but it's outside at the bottom. That shows you that now you can toggle that on and off. That doesn't do anything about fixing it, though. That's what the little triangle's for. And as I hover over that little triangle, I get that lock icon again, the little chain icon. I can click on there and it loads the overflow into my cursor. And I can draw out a new text box and the text boxes are linked. Let's see that. I go over to this text box, make it smaller. The overflow is overflowing into the box on the right hand side. So that's how you link the text boxes together. Very, very simple. For this demonstration, that doesn't really matter, though. So I'll get rid of that. I'll go back here and I'll take the overflow away. That's how you work with it, though. But I'm interested in formatting this text within this story. There's text that I need formatted in different ways. So this here, all of these lines here should be bullet points that are topics covered. And very simple to do, just make it bullet points and then I can change the spacing with it. So I should have in here somewhere my paragraph panel within my paragraph panel. At the moment, there is 12 points. So just to show you that there is 12 points space after each paragraph, which is fine between paragraphs, but not between bullet points. So I'm taking those down. So there's four that also alleviates the problem with my overflow. Now that's right. Oh, it's it's all put together this, you know. Right. So that's that bit sorted out. But I also have inline headings like topic covered, objectives and who should attend. 
Those really need to be in line headings. So I need to sort that out. So I'm going to just select one of them and I'm going to start formatting it. At the moment, it's Arial. As is the rest of the text, I, I would guess. Not going to worry about that, but I'm just going to show you that you have different ways to format that. You have the character panel and you have the paragraph panel. And what you set in the two of these acts together to determine what that actually looks like. So at the moment, it's Arial and it's 12 points. It's regular. It's green. It's got no underline. It's got no strike through. But you've got lots of things in here. You've got decorations, positions and transforms, typography. And this is just the characters. So what I am going to do is make it um, initial caps. So all caps with um, small caps, as it's known. So I've set that in there. Then I'm going to move on to the paragraph one. And this lets you set spacing, etc. So you've got your 12 points after, which, I, again, I don't really need. I'm going to set that to six this time. So it just pulls it a little bit nearer um, what's below it. But you've also got all these extra things. You've got tab stops, justification, flow options, bullets and numbering, baseline grid, hyphenation, drop caps, initial words, decorations, all sorts of stuff. It's amazing. Right. But for this one, I'm going to use this bottom one here, which is decorations. And what I'm going to do with this is put a decoration on the left hand side. So I've just put. Just press that there and you can see that's the decoration we're talking about. It's that black line. You can indent that, which is worse than useless, but you can outdent it by going into the negative. That's handy. You can change the color of it so I can go and make it Excel green starting to look better. But you can do more than that within the stroke. You can change the weight of it so I can change it from one point to a lot more if, if I want. Obviously, that's not great, but I'm going to set it to two. All will become clear why you can also in here change the cap so you can have it with rounded ends on it, squared off ends or make it a little bit taller. I'm going to go for the taller one there. And that's basically what that decoration does. But you don't have to leave it there. If you've used, used designer, you'll be aware of pressure options and you have the same pressure options in here. So I'm just going to click on that. What pressure does is make it thinner. So I'll just I'll, I'll drag this down. Let's just undo that bit and drag it down. Oh, you're not going to do it for me. Oh, you have to do it all together. Let's just drag the lot down. No, oh, I wanted to do that, but I didn't want that middle one. Right. What I've done is I've added an extra point and you can change the pressure here. So what I want is at the very beginning. And or the very end, I can do this and I can change how that actually looks. So what I did was that and it made it look like a diamond. I could have it different at the top or I could drag it all the way across there. And I've changed using the pressure options how that line next to it looked which I thought was amazing. Love that. Love that. Just finishes it off rather than it looking like a solid bar. Gets even better than that, though, because what I've got at that stage is the perfect heading and I want it applied to other elements. In fact, one thing I did want was to make that bold. That's better. So that's the perfect formatting for all of my headings. This is the point to create a style. So into the text styles panel and you can add a paragraph style or a character style, whatever kind you like. Character styles only apply the character formatting and paragraph styles apply the paragraph formatting. So I'm going to create a style here, which I'm just going to call Excel inline heading. And OK that. So that means now I've got a style, I can go over to the other ones and I can find my style in my list of styles here. There it is. And it will allow me to apply those like a recipe. So I want it on objectives as well. And I want it on who should attend. Want it there as well. Perfect. Perfect. But overview here was part of this. So I also want it applied to that. So let's apply it to the top bit. And let me just click away so you can see what you've got at this stage. There we go. And that's pretty much what I would expect to have. Here's where the magic comes in.
Double click that to edit it again. I want it applied to that middle one as well, which technically, from what we've seen so far, would give you three lines, three little arrows pointing downwards. But let's apply it. And it has the intelligence to link the three together and give you one long decoration on your text, which I think is pretty cool. So I can see this appearing in a lot of my work. You saw it here first. There you go. So I formatted all of that text there and created some styles. Now, styles. Styles are incredibly important. They are incredibly important because if we look at this data visualization at the top, it's a section of the document. And if we go back up here, we would want that to appear in our table of contents. For that to work, we have to make sure that the style of text that is applied to it. So let's go into here and have a look. What style of text is it? It is a heading one Excel. We need to make sure that that is included in the table of contents. So we'll see that when we create it. But just bear that in mind. You've seen me create a style and you've seen it applied up there. You've seen it within that text. Just be aware that styles are incredibly important because of the table of contents. Right. Other stuff. A couple of things to have a look at. We have looked at how oh, we need to look at the text wrapping options because text wrapping is so cool. Right. There is the text wrapping around that element there. But on my page where I hadn't done it, which was where have you gone? That one there. Not wrapping around it. So how does that happen? Right. Well, what you need to do is select it and then you have your text wrap options in this dialog box. So from the main toolbar, text wrap. You have lots of options. You have none, jump, square, tight, inside edge, all kinds of stuff. Let's make it jump. What it will do with jump is take the text away from it entirely. So it gives it its own line. You can have square, which will wrap it around it in a square, or you can have tight, which will wrap it around it tightly or even inside or edge, whatever you want to do with it. OK, so I'll set that to tight. What I found with this as I was doing it, as I was moving it, was I felt that on the right hand side, the text was closer than it was on the left. And what's controlling that is the distance options at the bottom. So I'll lock them on and then change them down. And you can see at that point, that's set to one. When you look at it, there's, it's fine on the left, but it's not so great on the right. To do that, take the lock off and change the right. Uh, oh, hang on, make sure you selected it and change the right on its own and you get a nice even layout. But it's that simple to wrap the text around things. Uh, I'll just use this graphic uh, in there. Shove that across. You can see that's over the top of it. But if you set this to tight, it will wrap that around it and you can see it pushing the text out of the way. You can turn that on and move the text inwards and it wraps around all of that. So text wrapping, incredibly straightforward. Right. One more thing you, you are going to love about text, which was in here. Just for fun, that is text on a path. Another holy grail of DTP. Very, very simple to do. You need, first of all, to draw a path. So pen tool. Click, drag out your path. So uh, I want it like that. Don't worry about this if it doesn't look right, because that's hideous. That's hideous. You can fix all of that later. That's drawing the path, but then you need to add the text. So artistic text tool. As you hover over it, you get a different cursor, which is a T with a wave underneath it. As you click, that locks the text onto the path and you can start typing on there. So just for fun was what I had typed at the top. Obviously, much too small. So let's make it much bigger. And it's not wrapping too well either. Not to worry. You can fix that with these handles. This green one and the red one there. Hang on, let's get that. Show you where it starts and where it finishes. And uh, we seem to have it upside down here. Where are we going here? Oh, it's upside down as well. Oh, this is fantastic. Uh, there we go. Let's pull it back a bit, etc. You get the idea. The interesting point is the node tool, which lets you edit that. And you see what happens as I'm moving. It's completely changing it. I can edit the handles and I can move the main points as well. 
So all of this, and you see what's happening as I pull that back. I think I made a much better job of it before, but you can see that I can move it there. So I would I would do that and get it to the shape you want it first, then add the text on. Everything that you can do to text, you can do to text on a path. So that's not the right font. The right font is Stingray. And it was white. So just change that in there to white. And you can change that at will. So not quite the same shape as that. But if I had a longer, I would sit here and start playing around with it so it matched it. But you've seen text on a path and it's very, very straightforward. Right. What else do we have to do before we wrap up? Mm, so much to see and do. We need another session. But I will show you adding a table of contents, which is back in our document, way back up here. Right. There is a table of contents there, but we don't want that. Let's just delete it. Oh, it's gone. What we do want to do is create a new one. So you need a text frame to put it in. So first of all, add yourself a text frame. Format that text frame as you need it. So I don't want it in two columns. I want it in uh, one. And I then want a certain style, etc. So I would do all of that as well. But first thing to do is to go into that text box and put in table of contents or however you want it worded. Oh, and it's picked up the Excel one. That's going to look great, isn't it? Let's change that back to body. Let's make it boring body. And we will not format that in the middle. We will take that to the top of the thing there and make that move down a bit. Go back and make that bold. Right. And then we need a table of contents. Now, as I've said, for this to work, magic needs to have happened, which is you have a complete panel for managing your table of contents. This is it. I'm going to go and insert a table of contents first, though, which is text table of contents, insert table of contents. And it puts in a table of contents. It's pulling these from anything that's formatted with a style that is included in here, which is why this bit in the actual body of the document and the bit on the left hand side need to be worked together. These are all the styles I have in my document. You can see not many of them have got checks in the boxes, but Oh, look, the ones that have appear in there. Now, one of the ones that I added in here was the Excel one. So let's have a look for the Excel one. Excel inline heading. If you remember, that was um, all to do with the headings within the text on that page. So I will uh, go over here. Let's put that in there. And it now adds those to the bottom. So it automatically gets updated and picks those up with anything that's formatted with that style. So the key to this working is create styles that are semantically correct, which means describe the content. So an Excel inline heading, it doesn't say green heading. Maybe Microsoft will rebrand Excel and it'll be purple. It says what it is, which is an inline heading within a block of text dedicated to Excel. And then put a tick in the box if you want it included in the table of contents. And within the table of contents, you can then format the table of contents in any way you choose. It's that simple. Couldn't be easier. So I'll move that over so uh, it looks a lot better. And do I have extra text? No, nope, I'm right. I'm up to page 30 and I'm done. So there's the table of contents. Just want to show you a couple more things. I know we're running long, but it's so worth it. Uh, one thing that I haven't shown you so far, which a lot of people will want to be aware is there, is all of these graphics that I've inserted in here, all of them, live inside this file. So this file is pushing 350, 400 meg. A lot of people don't want that. They want to be able to link to the files rather than embed them. For instance, files like these icons, they could update. Maybe it's a beta program like Affinity and the icon's going to change. You don't want to have to go through and change them all manually. You can do that if these files are linked to rather than embedded. And you manage that from Document Resource Manager. And that brings up this dialog box, which shows you every graphic that you have in this file. There they all are. And you can from here. So let's choose that Excel one. Let's get the Excel one. There's the Excel one. It's embedded. You can choose to make that linked. Just click the button. Tell it where the file is. 
So it's in Excel. It's there. And save it. It's saying it already exists. It's the same file. That's fine. Replace it. And now I have a linked file. When that file is updated on the file on the file system, it will be updated inside Affinity Publisher Beta. One final thing, which I just fell in love with, so we've got to see this, is going back to that that one I left you with, that conundrum I left you with, which was this one. Why is this so amazing? Well, it's amazing because this graphic here, this big pink graphic, exists on this page. It's not on the master. Want proof of that? The master for this is Outlook. It's not there. What is on this master is the stripe and the page number at the bottom. OK, so let's recreate that then, which is in here. And all I need to do is go and place a graphic, which is coming from Outlook. Outlook, so let's go there. It's the pink envelope. There we go. And I'm just going to draw it out. It's going to be fractionally too big if it's wide enough. That's fine. And I'll crop it down. Who has figured what the massive problem is? Hmm. I don't think anybody's twigged what the massive problem is. But you should be twigging right now as you're looking at it. Yeah. Right. First of all, need to change the opacity. I'll regret this because I'm, I'm not using the very, very, very latest beta. So that will stay on the screen. But we can live with that. We can live with that. Come on. Uh, no, 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 not you, not you, not you, silly me. It's this one in here. It is this one. Opacity, I want to take that right down. That's about right, isn't it? It's about right. Let's have it quite pink, though. Let's have it there. Right, not the best because the text's behind it, but that's easy, easy to be fixed. We have the graphic at the top here. All we need to do is drag it down under the text. So about here. And now the text is over the top. Fantastic. The problem that we have is the master, which is behind it, as would be expected, as in any application. And it's not brilliant because I can't see it properly. I have been in applications, no names mentioned, and I've had to go to the master and copy and paste the elements off the master onto the page over the top of the element that's covering them up. Think about that not happy. But what I can do in here is let's have a look at this layer panel. We have Outlook and Outlook. Oh, what are these? Let's have a closer look. They've got orange stripes down the side. That means if you were in designer, they are symbols. In publisher, it means they are the masters and they are just layers. Have a think. That means I can pick up the graphic, which is this one here, and move it down the layer stack. Let's put it bang in the middle. But I can also put it, oh, we should be down there, there we go, underneath it. So now these elements from the master are above that element there. That is huge. If you're into DTP, you should be sitting there thinking, oh my. You have control of where elements appear within the stacking order, including the master. Love that. Absolutely love that. OK, I'm going to save that file. And I'm going to have to close Affinity at that point because I've got things floating on the screen and go into a wrap up. OK, let's have a recap of all that we looked at. Well, we looked at a huge range of features, everything really, starting with a complete new document. Through all of the text features, the formats, the styles, the frames, character attributes, par paragraph attributes, we looked at tables. We said tables did not have to be boring. They absolutely don't have to be boring. Then there was text on a path and a couple of tricks that are really worth knowing. Control and W. Use that and it hides, toggles on and off all the elements, your layout elements to help you lay things out so you can get a better overall view. Also. There's the tab key, which hides the rest of the interface. So if you want more information about Affinity Publisher Beta, go to uh, affinity.serif.com. As I said, it's part of the, um, the, the, tr 
triple triple whammy from Affinity, which is Affinity Designer, Affinity Photo and Affinity Publisher now. Um, it's available right now in beta for Mac OS and Windows. As I said, it's also coming. Well, I won't say soon. It's coming eventually. Don't get excited on iPad. It'll be worth the wait. But right now you can actually sign up at affinity.serif.com slash en dash gb slash publisher and you can get your hands on it right now. A good place to have a look is the Affinity Publisher Beta Forums. Now, be warned, it gets a little heated in there at times. It's quite frightening when I was in there today, but there's some very, very useful information in there. So do go and actually have a look at the forums. As for more training, well, I've got so much more to talk about with this, so we need to do, we need to revisit, don't we? And I'll definitely revisit as the beta programme moves along as well. There's features I am really seriously hoping will arrive sooner rather than later. You can watch it live or you can watch it later on replay. Um, this one will be available. Haven't decided yet whether to leave this copy available or the high quality one. Depends how we go. We'll see how it goes. Um, the last one we did was Affinity Designer for iPad. So uh, that's on the channel as well. But on that channel, you'll find things for Affinity Designer going back to the very, very beginning, which was four years ago now. Also Affinity Photo, Affinity Photo for iPad and some quirky ones that are very long, but very worth watching, which is working with colour in Affinity Photo and working with colour in Affinity Designer. Obviously, I'll do a working with colour in Affinity Publisher not promising when, maybe when it's released, maybe sooner. But it's the stuff that you'll find in there. It's just basically an hour and a half of tips and tricks that people seem completely unaware of. But when you've mastered it, your workflow will just be amazing. So check those out. And as I say, those are the three apps that I'm spending a lot of my time in at the moment. And uh, you can get your hands on all of them. So thank you very much for being with me. If you have been with me live, if you are still watching this on replay, I'm amazed you've got through to the last slide. That's fantastic. You can contact me on any of those social platforms. Um, I would love to hear from you. What are you doing with it? Are you using it yet? Are you actually restraining yourself and waiting until the final thing's out. And if that sounds crazy, I do that with Mac OS. So there may be some people restrained enough out there not to be tinkering with a beta. But if you are, then I do want to hear from you. So what I'm going to do now is head off into Q&A and um, I will see you next time.